All right, well, good evening, everyone. I'm going to, well, this year we started with me giving little mini astro updates, just hitting things in the news in the astronomy world before other people's talks. And so tonight I'm opening for myself. I'm going to do the two brief topics here before I get into the uh, Star of Wonder tonight. So we're going to talk about the Space Treaty turning 50. Did you know that we had a Space Treaty? No. All right, we'll talk about that real quick. And then we have an update to gravitational waves. The first thing we did this last year was concerning the discovery of gravitational waves and what that meant to astronomy, a whole new type of astronomy. And already, this new frontier has a new frontier in it. All right, so the Space Treaty turned 50 in October. Uh, it went into force October 10th and 67. And it's uh, the legal framework for international space law. Yep, so it was originally called <clears throat> The treaty on principles governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. <laughs> I think space treaty is a little easier to remember. Um, parties uh, and signatories are in uh, green and yellow. Uh, and so those are the ones who in some way are, have agreed to this. So it's, it's a lot of the big players. The, you got the Japanese and Russian and uh, United States in there with uh, and most of Europe with all their space <coughs> programs. So that's nice. The people who are launching most of the things into space are part of the treaty. Uh, and what this covers uh, is something important like uh, there are no nuclear weapons allowed in space or weapons of mass destruction to be put in orbit or uh, hosted on the moon. Now this does not cover what are called ballistic or kinetic or conventional weapons. So you could put a gun up in space or a stick of dynamite. Uh, this is kind of creepy. The kinetic weapon is just a big hunk of metal and you just drop it on a city. And it actually, once it gets all the way down, it can take out a few city blocks theoretically. So yeah, that'd be a pretty nasty thing. And that would not be covered under the space tree. So you could do that. Um, we can't put military bases on the moon or other planets, and you can't run military exercises on the moon or other planets. Um, if you put spacecraft out to other planets, you have to sterilize them. Make sure that you're not going to put Earth germs on Mars or on the moons of Jupiter or something like that. So we, we destroyed Cassini this year, uh, plunging it into the upper atmosphere of Saturn itself, so it wouldn't just go dead and drift around, eventually hit uh, ring material or one of the moons and possibly contaminate with Earth stuff. So that's, that's, this is interesting stuff it covers. Um, you can't claim uh, any moon or planetary body for a nation. So even though we put the United States flag on the moon, it's not the United States of the moon. So it's not, not what we did. Um, and space exploration is done for the benefit of all nations. So when you discover something, you can you, know, you share it with everybody. So it's, and I think, as far as we can tell, that's all being uh, honored well. Now the interesting thing that's kind of left open here is that private company satellites, tourism, and exploration are allowed, and those are based on the parent nation's laws. So. The question that's come up recently is what do we do with materials in space? If you go mine an asteroid and get metal or even gold or something like that, valuable off of it, is that allowed? Um, so we already have planetary resources out of Redmond, Washington and Deep Space Industries out of California. They have websites you can go visit. And they've gone to Congress in 20, 2015 and got passage, this is passed now, the Spurring Private Aerospace Competitive and Entrepreneurship Act. And this says, well, the US has made the law that people can do that. We can go out and get stuff from space. And so these two companies are taking the lead in the United States to do that. Luxembourg uh, has also p passed the space mining law and they put aside taxpayer dollars in Luxembourg 
to help build a spaceport and help uh, spacecraft production. So you might get launches from Luxembourg sometime in the next decade or two as they start to work on that. So just something interesting in case you j didn't know that the space treaty is out there and that there's recent stuff about it. So are there any, who enforces the space law? Yeah, That's a good question. My guess would be it's done through the UN, but yeah, I mean, that'd be the, the planetary overseeing legal authorities maybe, but yeah. All right, and then we have an update on gravitational waves. Again, from before, if you were here way back, uh, gravitational wave is gravity creating waves in empty space-time. A gravity wave is an atmospheric phenomenon. So you can see here little ripples in the clouds. So different, different usages of the word. We're talking about gravitational waves, in case I said it wrong. You get two black holes going around each other. Let's see if this video plays, yay. You never know. So as they go around each other, they are causing distortions in space-time that are warping the background starlight, acting like a lens. And if these two come together, then you get an unbelievable release of energy. And I think that's coming on this, no? Let's see how long this little animation is. Yeah, it's just, there it is. It came together into one, and at that moment there's a, a, an explosion of energy outward as they came together. Uh, we saw in the earlier news update the very first gravitational wave discovery. The second came also in 2015. The third signal is a lot weaker, a lot further away, and kind of confusing to scientists. It was a different signature than the first two. And what they've pretty much decided is that the two black holes that came together were spinning in opposite directions uh, to each other. So they did very unusual things to the space time between them for just a moment. So here's what the new news is. 2017, August 17th. Uh, these detectors picked up what we now believe are two neutron stars coming together. And it was not really expected that we'd be able to see neutron stars. I mean, black holes will cause a big distortion in space time, but two neutron stars, wow. And this created a much longer um, signal, it was 100 seconds long. It's the fourth signal we've now seen. And what's really fun is that the Gamma Ray Space Telescope caught a flash from that general direction of space. It lasted about two seconds. And over the following weeks and months, over 70 observatories came together to study what had gone on to help them piece it all together. There's the signature. It's a lot weaker than the earlier pictures I showed, but definitely there's something there. And visually, we actually got a picture of this thing and figured out it was a galaxy 130 million light years away. Nothing there, and boom, there's some light coming from that outer reaches of that galaxy. And what this solved was a long-standing problem that we know the hydrogen and helium was made in the Big Bang. And we know that supernova, big stars that reach the end of their life, explode, throw a lot of material out into space. But one of the little secrets um, in, the, in the back halls of um, universities was how do you get the really heavy stuff created, like gold and platinum, uranium, things like that? Um, because that requires a lot of neutrons to be forced into the uh, core of atoms, the nucleus of atoms, to make this stuff. And suddenly, handed to us, we see neutron stars merging and how much energy was released. We're able to look at the spectra of the light afterwards, and we saw a lot of this heavy stuff directly using spectroscopy. Sorry. And the debris cloud here released 10,000 Earth masses of this heavier stuff. The remnant 
maybe it's a big black hole, just two and a half times more massive than our sun. Maybe it's just a very large neutron star. We don't know. We've not seen an object in space this in between size before. So pretty interesting. And the light faded out pretty quickly as it cooled down and the debris dispersed. So now we have this understanding from this discovery that in the Big Bang, we got hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. As stars, the bigger stars burn, they create everything from lithium up to iron, but not much more. And then when neutron stars merge, they make calcium on up to uranium and iron and spew that stuff out. So this really solves a pretty uh, big mystery in, in space. And neutron stars maybe merge every 10,000 years in one galaxy, but we can see these obviously many, many uh, millions of light years out and see a, watch a lot of different galaxies at once. Another thing this has solved, and it's made some physicists sad, is that we were trying to figure out what dark matter is. This is invisible stuff that far outweighs all the visible matter that we see in the universe. And we still don't know what it is. That's why we call it dark. Light goes right through it. Uh, right now, colossal amounts of it are flowing through you and the Earth, and it just ignores us. Um, one of the solutions for dark matter was that maybe gravity travels at a little different speed than light. And for complex reasons, you could modify how Newtonian physics is, is formulated to explain gravity that way. But now we have had gravity waves come and a light signal come from millions of, hundreds of millions, more than 100 million lights away. And the difference in arrival time of the two were less than two seconds, 130 million light years, thank you, less than two seconds apart. And we can probably explain those two seconds as just it took a while for the light to push its way through the debris around the emerging neutron stars. So this is an error between the speed of light and the speed of gravity of one part in 1.5 quadrillion. That's a real number. <laughs> That's a lot of zeros right there. So we have in evidence now that gravity and light probably travel exactly at the same speed, which is what Einstein said. And so all the physicists who are trying to explain dark matter this way have got to go to work at Burger King. <laughs> no, though. They'll find another job. So. All right, that's it for the news updates. And there we go, switching over to the other thing. So I will get into the Star of Wonder tonight. Any questions? I don't, didn't want to jump on from those two little things too fast. Anybody have any questions from that? Okay, so this uh, presentation is based on a planetarium show written um, a few decades ago for uh, Kirkpatrick Planetarium in the uh, Oklahoma City Science Museum. And I just keep beefing up and digging in deeper and filling in holes and stuff that, that they, they didn't cover. So this is a work in progress. As, as the years have gone on here. So we're very used to having a star. Yeah, you guys have the star. You're so good. <laughs> You're great, great volunteers here. A star on top of a Christmas tree. Uh, I, I know it's the Star Wars Death Star. Do you know Disney is not the reason for the season? So this is appropriate. Uh, never mind that. I think I've just discovered a new planet. Okay. So we're used to the, the picture of three uh, wise guys, or three wise men, traveling on camels across the desert following a star at Christmas time, heading to Bethlehem. So much so that some people have put it on their business cards. And I don't know why you do this. It's, it's like one month of the year that you, you know, do this, unless you're into camel sales or something. <laughs> So the nature of the star you know, is lost to history. We don't exactly know what this was or could have been. 
but it's very interesting to religion, history, science, and philosophy. So that's what we're going to do is jump into it. Now, could it have been the glory of God that, or light from angels that led their way? Absolutely. And that would be the end of the talk. So good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it certainly could be. And then there's nothing scientific to talk about. But there could be. And that's what we're going to go on and play around with. And to do that, we're going to look at the concept of the gospel and the stars and what astrology was in Judaism. So we'll ask this question. According to the Jewish people at the time, might have... It might have been something God built into the heavens. Might, might the heavens have proclaimed or declared the glory of God, as it says in the Psalms. So the beliefs we're going to try to explore here is that God placed meanings of the patterns of the stars of the zodiac on men's hearts. Maybe that figured into the star that they followed. We see in Genesis that God made the lights, and put uh, one to govern the day, one at night, uh, put up the constellations of the bear and Orion and the Pleiades. I determined the number of stars in Psalm. Jeremiah says we will write law on their minds and write on their hearts. And the next, next verse, he says, uh, He who appoints the sun to shine by day and decrees the moon and the stars to shine by night, stirs the seas and waves roar. So you've got this linking between God created all that and God wrote meaning on people's hearts. Uh, Romans also, going to the New Testament, showing the requirements of the law written on people's hearts, which is sim similar to Hebrews 8.10. All right, so to get further into what astrology was back then and even today, I know you're hearing about astrology in, a, in an astronomical facility. What's going on here? We'll get to that. Um, we need some science-y terms. What's a constellation? Well, a constellation is a grouping of stars that people agree will stand for, represent something. So here is Pegasus, a flying horse. I think it's easier to see a horse here. You've got a horse's head, a horse's head. There's a ho half of a horse. It's sort of a God the Father thing going on. <laughs> and then you got Andromeda here, sort of where the horse's tail should go, and, or back leg. Oh, yeah, we've got the constellations all across the wall here. And different peoples around the world made their own constellations. So we have the Lakota a tribe constellations over here. In many Native American lore, there were a handful of constellations, 10, 12, 15, 20. In um, Japanese culture, there were well over 3,000. So if you had to do your astronomy class back then, you had a lot to study for in the test. But the uh, International Astronomical Union in the late 20s decided there'd be 88 constellations, made them formal, um, took mostly from Greek uh, culture for the constellation name, but most of the stellar names, the star names, are Arabic in origin. So the same number of constellations officially in the sky as there are keys on a piano. So a trivia there for you. Uh, conjunction is our next important term. It's when two or more things in the sky get really close to one another. How close is really close? Well, that's not really defined. If you go up there, if you go outside and go, wow, those two things are close, oh, you just saw a conjunction of whatever those things are. It could be flight 704 bound for Denver. It could be conjunction real, real quick across the sky. The ecliptic is the path of the sun and moon and planets to the stars. The, almost everything in the solar system is rolling around in a flat disk, like BBs on a plate. You've got the sun in the middle, and you've got the orbits of the planets, and the moons, very close, uh, stick to this nice flat plane. Pluto's a little oddball, but we've already voted him off the island. So, <laughs> so the zodiac means circle of animals 
and not all these are animals, I don't know why they do that, but uh, <coughs> from the Earth's point of view, you look towards the sun and what the constellation beyond it is, and you've got what constellation that the sun is in. So that's, that's 12 of them officially, um, which fits nicely with 12 months. There actually is Ophiuchus that pokes down in here between Sagittarius and Scorpius. So if you were born right in there, you might be an Ophiuchan. So <laughs> tell somebody that at a party. So. <coughs> so with the Earth sitting in space here, we've got a North Pole going up into the sky up here, North Celestial Pole, the South Pole going down here. Right around the middle of the Earth is the equator, and up in the sky is the celestial equator right above it. And the path of the sun and moon and plants is the dotted line. So it's below on one side and above on the other because the Earth is tilted. We're tilted, we're not perfectly up and down, and that gives us the seasons. All right, so what is astrology? This is the belief that the position of the sun, moon, and plants and the stars tell of what is to come in some fashion. And we know in modern science that there is no force that can do that. That the gravitational pull of Jupiter is a tiny fraction of the doctor's gravitational pull in the, in the operating, uh, in the delivery room. So there's no force doing it, but people's beliefs are a different thing. So in Zodiac in Hebrew translates to Maseroth, and we'll talk about that more, but in Job we have, can you lead forth the signs of the Zodiac in their seasons, or guide the stars of the bear with her young? Um, it, that translation in the NIV is, can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons? So if you were a God, would you communicate the most important message to humanity, humanity only in a book that's going to be largely put together later? or write it on everybody's uh, hearts. Well, we would expect that multiple people would have sim similar figures in the constellations, and <coughs> many different groups did have very similar meetings, meanings to these 12 constellations around the civilizations uh, that are, were in good shape, I'd say, at that time. So to go through this meaning of constellations. We're going to start with Virgo. We're going to go around the zodiac in this direction and look at the overall ver um, uh, meanings. So starting with Virgo, we start with the Virgin, the Virgin Mary. So we have the birth of Christ from a virgin. We've got Libra, the scales, next. This is the false gospel of the balance of good works versus bad works. So, you know, if I do a few more good things, then that kind of makes up for the bad things, and that isn't, that isn't the gospel. That's, that makes people work real hard and not get anywhere, so. Scorpion, Scorpion is at the bottom. It's at the lowest part in the sky. And this is the sting of death right there. So this is the foe that Jesus defeated. Sagittarius is a half man, half horse, and in the theologians that play with these ideas, whenever you have a constellation that's two things at once, you've got a picture of Christ there. So he's flinging an arrow, shooting an arrow into the heart of death, uh, sin and death just to the right in the sky. The next is a half and half goat and fish. So you have another dual nature picture. Uh, this is the sacrificial lamb or goat. Uh, Jesus was for all time, and fish, when you get water mixed in, you've got the Holy Spirit coming into the story, which leads us to Aquarius, the water bearer, the source of living water, his Holy Spirit. Some theologians put that, link that with Noah's flood. And what comes next is a really important constellation in the zodiac, and that's Pisces the fish. This is two fish here. Some theologians link that to be the Old and New Testament tied together. Um, um, sign for church, the church, the age of Christ. The age comes from the fact, uh, I'm jumped ahead here. Yeah, that the vernal equinox, the point where the sun is on the first day of spring, is in this constellation. And the age is determined by where the vernal equinox is. 
So, <coughs> the Greek word for fish, uh, ichthyus, we have that symbol used by early Christians, afraid of persecution, that they do a little swoop in the sand, and then if somebody completed it, then you could talk about um, Christianity stuff without getting in trouble. This is the age of Pisces, the, a wobble in the Earth's axis, 26,000 year long wobble, changes the position of the constellations at, with respect to the sun and the seasons. So this means that over time the vernal equinox will drift out of Pisces and into Aquarius. And that's where the song, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. That's rooting for the next age. Like, let's get out of this uh, Christian age, let's get on to the next. And so that's sort of the rooting of that. So the vernal equinox, Pisces, the ichthyus, and the current age are all tied up together in that part of the zodiac. Next one along is Aries, the ram. Sacrifice for all, again, the final sacrifice um, on the altar. And then emerging from that is Taurus the bull. So you have the picture of resurrection. Over in the western sky is Taurus rises, Scorpius is setting. So you're, you're losing uh, sight of sin and death down in the west. Gemini the twins, again, you got the dual nature, some theologians put this as to being the Christ and the church is one, or the bride and the bridegroom imagery. Cancer of the crab is the next one along the zodiac. It's got the star cluster, the beehive cluster, which ancient people saw as being the multitude or the, the descendants of Abraham promised. And then the last one is Leo the lion, the king, the Leo, uh, lion of the house of Judah, uh, the end of the series, the end of time, also pictured as Aslan in C.S. Lewis's books. And there are many other links between um, religion and uh, astronomy. The placement of Easter on the calendar is located on the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the moment that the sun is on the vernal equinox, which is the moment that spring begins. That can be as early as March 22nd or as late is April 25th, and it usually occurs about a week after Passover. Hanukkah occurs on the 25th day of Kislev and concludes on the second or third day of, is it Tibet? Am I saying that right? Uh, and this is based on a lunisolar calendar, um, the Hebrew calendar. They had 13 uh, cycles or months in a year, and then you had the year as the solar year itself. We have lots of other constellations mentioned. Uh, we've got the zodiac described in Job, um, Psalm where God calls the stars by name, uh, purpose of the stars in Genesis, Romans, uh, talking about not worshiping this, and we'll get to that at the end. Even the 12 tribes of Israel were linked to the 12 constellations of the zodiac or the Maseroth. So there's tribe of Judah is Leo and Zebulon, Virgo, etc. It's in Job 38-32. And their placement around the tabernacle in the wilderness uh, was linked to the signs of the zodiac. And when they laid everything out, the tribe of Levi in the center, you got a cross shape. The camp of Israel there. So there seems to be a good link between the stuff in the sky and the, the contents of the Bible. So could God have written this on mankind's part and could this lead to the Christmas story itself? So to do that, we need to figure out when Christ was born. So our system of counting suggests that Jesus was born in the year zero, but there wasn't a year zero. The, you have B.C. and A.D. years, but zero was evil. You couldn't, what happens if you divide by zero? Okay, let's, let's do a quick division here. So if I go, um, what's four divided by two? Two. two. 
What's 4 divided by 0? How many zeros go into 4? Infinite. Infinite, right. Yeah, and tell, letting the population handle infinity, that, that can get messy. So you've got to keep infinity out of the public eye. So we went straight from 1 BC to 1 AD. This is the time when the Roman Empire was in full, at its full height of power. Uh, Gaius Octavian had been emperor of Rome since the year 27 BC. Uh, is now known as Caesar Augustus. And Herod was in charge of Judea, and he was a nasty guy. Um, and we get a lot of the details of his reign from Flavius Josephus, a historian at the time. And so we have Herod's rule coming in to some point in here. We're not really sure yet, but we'll work on that. Um, no clear record when Herod became king of Judah, uh, Judea, but it probably occurred around 38 BC. But Josephus tells us that he died at the time of Passover just before an eclipse of the moon. We can run computer programs back and find past eclipses. So there's a full eclipse of the moon. And we can see that one occurred March 13th of the year 4 BC that was seen over Israel. So we can tag here that he, Herod had to have died right around there, late winter 4 BC. So the birth of Jesus had to come before this time. Another clue is that um, Mary and Joseph came to Bethlehem to be counted um, and, ta and tax as part of our uh, empire-wide uh, taxation. It probably took a while for these, the news of a taxation to be announced. Um, so you know, they didn't have the internet. You couldn't just send a text out. Uh, but we know there was a taxation in 27 BC, 7 BC, and 14 AD. So we have a census here, here, and here. 27 BC is way too early, 14 AD is too late, so the taxation proclamation of 7 BC is probably the one that, that got them um, uh, moving, going back to their hometown. And it probably would have taken a year or two for the word to got gotten across Judea. So Jesus was taken into Egypt by Mary and Joseph to avoid the decree by Herod that all the male infants under two be put to death. Jesus didn't return to, to, to Judea until after the death of Herod. So we probably have to allow a couple of years for the journey into and back from Egypt. The only period of time where these events overlap is the 7 BC down to 5 BC window. And we can work backwards from the ministry of Jesus and maybe nail this down a little bit further. We know for, in Luke uh, that Jesus started his ministry at about 30 years of age. Luke, uh, that was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. So we have records of that. And then in John, he has a dispute with the Pharisees and they complain that, that in 46 years, the, uh, was this temple in building and you want to raise it or tear it down in three days. So in this discussion happened around 27 to 29 AD. So 28 AD was about Jesus' 32nd birthday, so we're coming back to that. We're down to about 6 to 5 BC for his birth. Can we go further in? Can we maybe get to the time of year? Now the Bible says Jesus was born while shepherds were in the fields keeping watch over their flocks at night. And we've come to celebrate Christmas in December, but you're not going to have sheep out there having babies in the middle of winter. Uh, they're a little bit further south in latitude than we are here in Denver, but it still gets really cold. Um, they would be in the fields in springtime when the new lambs are being born. So by process of elimination, we can now uh, get the date of Christ's birth down to the springtime of the year 6 BC. A little flashing star right there. But why are we having Christmas in December? We're, it's what, a week plus away? Well, that comes from these changes in the sky that we talked about before. So the sun rides high in the summer and low in the winter. In the summer, the days are long and the nights are short. And in the winter, the days are short and the nights are long. There's a point down here 
December 21st, the first day of winter, that you have the longest possible night. And it takes a few days for astronomers using just visual techniques to see if the sun is now heading back north and the days are starting to get longer again. But early beliefs, people be afraid that maybe the sun will just keep sinking and disappear forever. Ah! That'd be really cold. On uh, ancient Rome, they were sophisticated enough to not really get worried about this. But by the 25th, it was ingrained uh, in, in the society that this is the point that you know that the sun's coming back up. And the Romans are not going to pass up an opportunity for a good party. So they had the festival of the Saturnalia. Uh, and it was a crazy time of celebration. And Christians were being persecuted across the Roman Empire. They realized they could have their own celebration if they did it during the time of the Sat Saturnalia. And so we have Christmas celebrated in the middle of winter now. Um, from that. Right? So what might uh, have predicted the birth of Jesus? What could that event have been? Well, we're, now we're to the star. After all that, we've gotten to the star. And a star at any time could have been something in the sky like a fixed star, but everybody knew what they were. Everybody could make pictures or draw the fixed stars and make a map, and so people wouldn't have been excited about that. But then we also have falling stars, bearded stars, new stars, and wandering stars. So perhaps the star of Bethlehem that announced this big event was one of those. Let's take a quick look through those. Falling stars we call Meteors, meteoroids are up in space, those are the rocks before they get here. Meteors are the flash of light in the sky, and when it hits the ground, oh, I should be meteorites. I have, a, I have this a typo there, sorry. Meteorites are on the ground, ignore that. <laughs> the way to remember that is you can make a, a lot of money selling one on eBay if you find one. So if they're up in space, you can't get your hands on them and, and sell them. So you're annoyed that you see a meteorite. But if you find one, you go, all oh, right, I've got a meteorite. So, okay, you'll never forget it now. But these are little bits of sand, grains of uh, sand, dust, little rocks, uh, hitting the atmosphere really fast. We're moving tens of miles per second. So if you put your hands together, I'm not trying to get applause, I'll wait for the end. Now rub your hands real fast, rub, 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 rub. Okay, this is, that warmth you feel is friction. Okay, you can stop. Probably felt good if your fingers are a little cool. Um, these things are coming so fast that the friction with the atmosphere makes them flash hot, quite hot, and partly burn up. But these are really common. In fact, we, we have the, um, is it the, Geminid meteor shower is going right now, just peaked. Uh, people saw those all the time. You can go out any night, just lay on the ground for a while, look up, you'll see a meteor going some direction. And they're really short-lived, uh, maybe a second or two, a few seconds long, if you get a bolide, as talking about earlier. Um, but that's not going to be a really good star. The Magi needed to come from what is present-day Iran region all the way over. And so a meteor is not going to last long enough. Another would be a bearded star. We call these comets. Uh, these are lumps of rock and dust and ices, frozen atmospheres, uh, atmospheric components like oxygen and like that, nitrogen, that when they get close to the sun, warm up and give off the gases and dust, <coughs> making big, beautiful tails. So, and they can wander through the, the sky for weeks, even be visible for a month or two. Mm, that sounds like a better candidate. Uh, the most famous uh, comet uh, everyone's heard about is Halley's Comet. We even see it in the uh, tapestry in 
uh, Bayou, France. It uh, surrounded the uh, events of the Norman Conquest of England in 1066. And people are going, ooh, look at the thing up in the sky. They're all pointing up there, just like we do today. But most of the time, people saw comets as a, a foreteller of impending doom. So maybe that's not the best. <coughs> and especially with Chinese astronomers, they did a really good job recording things that happened in the sky. And we don't see a record of a comet appearing in the night skies around the time of the birth of Christ. OK, maybe it's a fixed star or a new star. We have a couple names for these, depending on how they uh, form, a nova or a supernova. Novas come from something like a neutron star or a white dwarf, eating off the atmosphere of an expanding partner. The material builds up until it ignites in f uh, nuclear fusion and lets off an awful lot of light for a little while. It can be days a week or so. Supernovas occur when a big star, as I talked about earlier, exhausts its fuel and the center makes iron instead of other materials. Basically, the star collapses on itself and bounces off the, the core in the middle and blows material out into space. And these things can outshine a galaxy for a little while. In 1054, July 4th, we had a brilliant uh, one show up in Taurus the Bull. Uh, Chinese astronomers called it a guest star. They said it was brighter than the full moon and was visible in the daylight for two months. That's a pretty good one. We, today, this is Meze object number one. We call it the Crab Nebula. It's got a neutron star in the middle. You can see this in any of the telescopes uh, a little bit later in the winter. These are just, this is just rising about now. Uh, Arabian, Persian, Babylonian, Chinese astrologers and astronomers did keep good records. The oldest recorded supernova was by Chinese astrologers in 185 AD. The earliest recorded sunspot is 364 BC, and the earliest surviving comet record is Halley in 240 BC. So we have pretty good coverage for events like this. And again, nothing right around uh, the birth of Christ. <coughs> We have uh, five such events, supernova, in recorded history, and none of them are around that time. So maybe we need to go deeper. Who saw this star? Maybe that's what's important here. Uh, we don't have biblical evidence that Mary and Joseph saw the star. If you look at a Christmas card, you go, how could you not notice it? But <laughs> don't get your theology from a Christmas card. Uh, shepherds didn't see it. They reported angels, but not the star. King Herod didn't see it because he had to ask the wise men about it. And <clears throat> looking at other cultures, back then there were about 200 million people on the earth. Today, the United States alone has 326 million. The world is at 7.44 billion. So we have a few more people on Facebook now than there were back at 6 BC. <laughs> And the civilizations uh, up and running at the time, you had ancient Rome, you had ancient India, uh, you had the imperial China uh, going at that time. And these civilizations did not report a star like that. Who are the ones we know saw it? And these are the wise men. So the identity of the star of Bethlehem must lie with them. Who were they? They called themselves the Magi. They came from Persia, which is present-day Iran. The word Magi is the root of our modern English words magic and magician. They were soothsayers or astrologers. Oh, that's why John's doing all this astrology stuff. <laughs> they were high priests of the Zoroastrian religion, and their job was to make predictions and foretell events based on the observations of the nighttime sky. Now, we only think there were three of them because there were three gifts, and it's in Christmas songs, and again, it's on Christmas cards. Where don't get your theology there. In Eastern Christianity, they often list 12 magi. And their names came along much later and vary in different sects. So 
we don't really know if there are those three. Um, but as wise, the wise men spent much of their time studying these five celestial objects, these wandering stars. Today we call these planets, we know what they are. We sent spacecraft out to all of them and even ones that have been demoted and gotten images and radar back and we know a lot of stuff about them. But back then these were points of light that moved through the stars that looked like stars. They were maybe signs moved by the gods and me, reading their movements could tell what the gods had in mind. The ones we're going to look at in particular are Jupiter which goes around the sun every 12 years. Saturn goes around every 30 and they pass each other about every 20 years. So, if the Star of Bethlehem was not a supernatural miracle and just a, a light produced, but a miracle built into creation itself, then we can probably see an astronomical and astrological possibility kind of cross the, uh, the streams there. And since they were Zoroastrian priests, they would have known the, the prophecies in the area, like in Numbers 24, um, I see him now, but not now. Behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter king will rise out of Israel. John Gill is a uh, commentator, biblical commentator. He, he expands this to say, when a star steers its course into Jacob, then a scepter bearer shall rise up unto Israel. It indicate that a star would be an index finger pointing to the prophesied owner of the scepter. The right... Uh, to govern, govern Israel. And what did happen at this time was an incredibly rare triple conjunction, which is just two things passing close together in the sky, of the planets Jupiter and Saturn. And to the Zoroastrians, Jupiter was the king of the planets. It was, it was, it was Marduk to the Babylonians and Zeus to the Greeks. Saturn is known as the harvester or the reaper uh, or a picture of Kronos. So time. So they would have read this as the time of the harvester has come. The king of the Hebrews is arriving. This happened in Pisces the fish, the constellation of the age where the uh, vernal equinox was and still is located. So they would even add more to that. So the king of the Hebrews is arriving at the dawn of the age of Pisces. Now they knew that wandering stars loop sometimes, they, they'd watch that. And <clears throat> Jupiter and Saturn do loops every year. And what this loop is called is a retrograde loop. And you've seen retrograde loops probably happen on your way here. What are you talking about? Well, if you took the left lane of the highway or the freeway, you probably passed some slow cars or trucks on the right lane. Hopefully you weren't speeding, but they were going slower than you. So at first you see them driving forward, you know they're, they're going fast and forward, you can see things vanishing behind them from the front to the back. But as you catch up with them, they seem to kind of stop, and then they go backwards. They're not going backwards, you're just going faster than them. But then eventually you're so far away, if you look in your rear view mirror, you see that, yeah, they're still coming forward, no, no problem. It's just you've passed them and you're continuing to go off into the distance. So Earth goes around the sun faster. We go once a year versus multiple years for Jupiter and Saturn. So we pass them, making them do an apparent loop in the sky um, as they go. So we're going to look at what the sky looked like over a year, right here on this side of the loop, right in Pisces. And I will start it here. We're starting on March 22nd, 7 BC. I've got a bunch of lead time built in here so I can explain what you're seeing. So this uh, <coughs> yellow line right here, oh, sorry, green line right here is the path of the sun and moon and planets called the ecliptic. The red line is the equator of the earth up in space. There's the sun, the first day of spring. Here's Saturn and there's Jupiter. And they did not know about Uranus, so don't, don't worry about that. 
They could have seen it theoretically, and it was observed even earlier than this, but people didn't know it was a planet. All right, so here's Saturn and Jupiter, and it's going to start moving through Pisces right here. Better be moving as soon as I touch the mouse. Oh, yep, there we go. I knew it. So there's Jupiter and Saturn. That they get so close to the software, it stops drawing the name Saturn as they pass close. Second pass, third pass. And here comes Mars, and here comes the Sun at the end of the year. March 10th, 6 BC. All right, it's going to back up again and do it again in case you missed it the first time. All right, here we go again. There's Saturn, keep your eye on Saturn, passing Jupiter. Jupiter is the one stable in the middle. There goes Saturn, one pass. Second pass. Third pass. And Mars comes in, and here comes the Sun. And really zooming in, this, this plays a lot quicker. You can see Saturn and Jupiter pass each other. Pisces is illustrated as the two fish tied together. Second pass and third pass. So, how unusual is that? Oh, well, it's pretty rare. Uh, on average, about every 450 years this occurs. The other ones on either side of 7 BC you got 1,953 BC, you got one at 146 into the next year, 145 BC. After that, it's 152 AD. And this had not occurred in Pisces since the Zoroastrian religion was founded, which is you know, roughly in, uh, 450 BC. So only 14 times in 2,800 years did it even look close to this. So it was a pretty significant event. Other theories have existed, even uh, Halley, an astronomer, had his own favorite. I think he liked the um, uh, Jupiter-Venus one here. We have a lunar eclipse of Jupiter, the moon covered Jupiter and Aries uh, at 6 BC, which is a little late. Uh, you have a conjunction between Jupiter and the star Regulus, known as the Little King to, to the Magi, um, in 3 BC. And 2 BC, much too late. You had a conjunction between Jupiter and Venus in 17, June 17th, 2 BC, too late. Jupiter and Saturn conjunctions happened 66 BC and 125 BC, but weren't conjunctions then. So, yep, it's, it's the best in the timing. <coughs> and Mars joined Jupiter and Saturn at the end. And that really kicked the uh, Magi's trip to Bethlehem off. They knew that if Jesus came, that he was going to, well, his father, even his, um, I lost the word, disciples, thank you, uh, expected him to kick Rome out, and he didn't. He went to the cross instead, which really disheartened people who thought he was just going to come and clean house. He did in a different way. But Mars is the warrior uh, coming in at the end of that, that cycle there. The Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, seems to get it right. It said, O morning stars together. Yeah, they got plural. Uh, proclaim the holy birth. Okay, I don't know if that really is proof of anything. But let's put the timetable together here. So we have a Roman world census. Census reached Palestine in 7 BC. First appearance of the star, the first pass. 7 BC, second and third appearance happen rapidly in the end of 7 BC. And Mars comes into the picture, the Magi start traveling. Uh, you have the birth of Jesus in the spring here with Joseph and Mary traveling to Bethlehem there. And then back here you have, at the end of the year, Herod's order to kill the babies, and their flight to Egypt around that time. You have the death of Herod in 4 BC and their return from Egypt. So, how then did the wise men actually find Jesus? Can we go even further than that? Or was a star in the end a miracle after all? In Matthew, 
said, uh, wise men in the east came saying, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So from this we see that the arrival of the wise men in Jerusalem happened after Jesus was born. Uh, they, the viewing of the star started them on their journey and they were important enough people to get to talk to the king. So they were, they were way up in the Zoroastrian religion. Matthew, you have O you uh, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will sh shepherd my people Israel. That refers back to Micah, which is another prophecy that they would have known of. That you, Bethlehem, uh, I can't say that. <laughs> Ephrathah, thank you. Uh, though you are small among the clans of Judah, you will come uh, for me, one who will be ruler of Israel, whose origins are from all the ancient times. Matthew 2, um, he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I may too come and worship him. So the word went out, where is this going on? Sent them to Bethlehem, so that was expected. But Herod was going the secret plan route, like, yeah, go ahead, you find him. I'll just come and worship him. Yeah, sure. Um, but he had to ask his advisors when the star had appeared. So maybe astrologers as well. It wasn't known to him or the general population what the star was doing or where it was leading. Matthew, though, we see that they came until it stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly. And they came into the house and saw the child with his mother Mary. In a house now, not in a stable. You don't see manger then. They presented their gifts. So where did this part happen? Where did that go? The star continues to take an active role in guiding them even at this point. That's something that an astrological, astronomical event would not easily do. But was there more meanings to Jupiter and Saturn and Mars um, <clears throat> moving back through the evening sky that's now lost to history? All right, so our final step asks, did the Magi go to Bethlehem? In Luke, when we see that when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee. Nazareth is referred to as the city of Galilee in the home of Mary. That's about 70 miles or a two to three day trip. Now, according to the law, Jesus would have been circumcised on the eighth day in the temple. Mary would have performed her purification on the 33rd day. So the prophecy named Bethlehem and Herod ordered all the male children two and younger in Bethlehem and all that region killed. The Magi probably went to Bethlehem, but may have had to travel to Nazareth to catch up with Jesus. Even then, the shepherds knew about Jesus, and maybe many more would have then too. So they may have had to make another little bit of a trip to get there. So Jesus might have arrived back at Nazareth a month and a half after his birth. What's interesting going on in the sky is that behind the sun, and invisible to anybody at the time, on the first uh, um, day of spring in 6 BC, the sun, moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, Venus, and even undiscovered Uranus at the time, were all within a small distance from each other. They would have been overhead at the zenith on the meridian at 12.47 p.m. in Bethlehem, nicely centered. And it looked like this, big clustering of all the planets in Pisces with the sun. By mid-May, this part of the sky with all the planets clustered together would have finally been in the pre-dawn sky as and been observable to the astrologers. And Jesus would have been about one to two months old at this time. And what's kind of fun is that May 15th, the moon scra scraped right over the uh, top of Jupiter. So we had Jupiter, the moon, in fact, Jupiter and the moon are so close here that Jupiter's painted behind the, the picture in the graphic because the moon's too big in here. So taking the travel time, and this in, one more interesting piece of the stuff going on in the sky, then a couple more months go by after the birth of Jesus, the Magi travel a little bit further and maybe found him in Nazareth. And then Herod's order goes out when he realizes these Magi are not coming back to tell me where he is. 
all right, everybody's got to die. And they make the flight to Egypt. So birth maybe around March 21st, 6 BC. Magi meet him maybe around May 15th, 6 BC. The Magi don't return and the kill order goes out in the summer of 6 BC. So wrapping everything up. Is astrology good for telling your future? No. <laughs> um, are the heavenly bodies something to worship? Well, the Tower of Babel in Genesis, come let us build ourselves a city with the tower that reaches to the heavens. Uh, could it be that it reaches to or is dedicated to the worship of the heavens? Well, God didn't like that. So don't, don't worship the stuff in the sky. Um, are constellations essential in telling the gospel presently? No, we've got a really good book. And we have apps now on our phones that have that. Uh, the skies may have been a way uh, God made that all men would have uh, come without excuse in coming to know him. So Romans uh, states that. To really get it, you need the author, the spirit of Christ, uh, working on you and bringing his Bible and word and stars to life. So it could have been a miraculous star, an angel, or God's light, or it could have been the miracle of God putting the heavens into motion in a way that over millions or even billions of years you can't predict, but it all came together in the right spot in the right time to bring Magi across, led him to Jesus who was born in the major. <coughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> so any questions? That's a lot of information. <laughs> yes. Were there any other um, lunar eclipses around that time? Like seven, eight? I don't believe so, no. You usually get one every two, three, four years. But they can also be occurring on the other side of the Earth, so you've got decreased. It's been a little while since we've had a lunar eclipse even here. I can't remember when the last one was. It was a couple of years ago, right? Three? The last lunar eclipse yeah. was in September of 2015. Yeah, 2015. So we're up to a little more than two years gap now. Yeah. So. I remember when it and it was around January, and it was at the middle of the night. Yep. <laughs> and we had another one. Yeah, I was out observing that. Oh. It kept getting lower and lower. We had to keep moving across the street and up into our neighbor's uh, driveway to keep seeing it over the other neighbor's house. And yeah. like, we're going to wake them up. Yeah. Right, any other questions? Yes. Uh, John, uh, could you talk a little bit about the software used, uh, that you used to run the clock back here? Right, the software How I used. How accurate it is? And, and how much credence we ought to put in those figures? Yeah, this uh, Starry Night software is what I use. I, I like the. I've been beta testing Starry Night Pro Seven recently, but this is done in Starry Night Pro Six, and the planetary positions uh, errors are extremely low going forward and backward. I think at ten thousand years. So I think the programs will stop going 10,000 years forward or backward because then the errors become big enough that it doesn't matter. Uh, it's not, not worth saying that you're telling someone something about the sky that isn't numerically provable. So we're only dealing 2,000 years here, so the errors are very, very tiny. Probably arc minutes to tens of arc minutes um, so yeah, way below the resolution of anything here. And this would have been uh, good even with a few degrees of error. Yeah. What are the things that cause the errors over greater than 10,000 years? Is it uncertainty in masses of objects or objects we don't know about? Uh, some of it is, it's funny, I, I hit a slide that actually explained that. I just try, tried to nip things down a little bit. Um, the, <clears throat> you have to know First off, the speed, position, and orbital parameters of a, of a heavenly body now. And we have really, really, really good measurements, but you can't measure anything perfectly. So there's some point where your, your digits stop and the errors start to build up from way down in the uh, calculations there. Uh, but the other is um, Newton's 
multi-body gravitational problem. That when you have two things going around each other, they can be perfectly predictable forever. But when you add one more thing in there, three bodies, you'll eventually get chaotic behavior. Chaotic. Right. Yeah. So they create errors in each other. You get gravitational tugs of everything else around. And we have a lot of bodies in the solar right. system. But relative to each other, they're very tiny and very, very far apart. So still the errors are very small, but over vast amounts of time, uh, they, they do move around and errors build. Yeah. Good questions. Yes? You mentioned the season being in the spring, and I know you've tied that to the shepherds watching the uh, walks at night. Mm -hmm. But didn't you say something else about how you came to the spring, and I just can't remember? Um, Part of your, uh, part of your display and everything else, and one of those conjunctions along here, everything else. Oh, yeah, the yeah, the travel times of, of that. Also, we backed up from Jesus' ministry back into uh, part of a year. So. Any other?